Uh, but my thing of the week is uh, Transformers: Rise of the Beasts, uh, which is now on Paramount Plus. You poor man. I actually decided to try to give it a watch, and after about five minutes, I was like, "This is just extra figures being sm- smashed together." <laughs> No, there, there was quite a lot of that, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so this movie uh, is uh, takes place uh, seven years after Bumblebee, uh, so it's in 1994. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it now makes me sad to realize that 90s nostalgia is for young people. What like. 60s or 70s nostalgia would be for us. It's like, why would you send in a boring year like 1990? That wasn't that long. Ago. Oh my God, it was 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it, it it's very hard. It, it's it, it's me where I live. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, but uh, but yeah. So um, uh, the movie starts off. Uh, actually, it starts off before that. Uh, the the scene that DB was just referencing. Um, the uh, the Maximals are uh, on the run from uh, the minions of uh, Unicron, uh, uh, called the Terracons, and uh, the, the, they're led by Who? yeah, and they're led by uh, the leader is Scourge, uh, AKA voiced by Megatron. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, one of uh, well, he was one of Galvatron's um, minions in uh, in the animated movie. Um. And then I can't remember who the other. There were two other ones. I can't remember who. I can't remember the names. But but clearly, Scourge was patterned off of the '90s version of Megatron from Beast Wars, with like uh, yeah. the rotating tail sword arm thing. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so they're uh, they have in their possession um, the MacGuffin, uh, which is called uh, the Transwarp Key. Of course, I hear Transwarp, and I think Star Trek. Um, but, uh, apparently it's a, it's a device that allows people to, uh, to, uh, move from, uh, move through space and time to go anywhere in space and time. So basically like the TARDIS, <laughs> um, and, uh, so they, they have to keep it away from, uh, from Unicron cause you know, they don't want him going around eating planets and then they end up on earth, right. of course. Cause Unicron is kind of the death star and Galactus smashed together. Because he's much, a yeah. he's a giant space station thing. What I thought one cool kind of cool thing in the about ten minutes of it I watched was uh, that he, it's like he had parasites on him, like mechanical parasites. Yeah, crawling around. Yeah, and and Scourge has these two like like dog dog things that that are that work with him. They're, they he has attached to him now. But yeah, um, he, he's the Death Star in that he's a giant orb. He's Galactus in that he eats planets and has heralds. Yes. Um, and, uh, so they end up on earth, uh, and of course, uh, then we, we are introduced to, um, the, the main human character in the movie, uh, his name is Noah Dave, uh, Noah Diaz, excuse me, not Noah Davis, Noah Diaz. Uh, he's, um, a young Puerto Rican man living in Brooklyn with his, uh, his mom, who's a single mom, single working mom, and his, uh, younger brother, who's, uh, who has an illness. Um, and, you know, of course it's the typical thing they're trying to make ends meet. And, you know, he, uh, he gets, he, you find out that, uh, he was a, he was in the army and he was a communication specialist in the army. Oh man. Communications. That's a phony degree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, d- d- does that uh, technical expertise come into play at all in the movie for to help him out with uh, help okay. him out what's out? Yeah, I mean, considering that he's going to be hanging out with giant robots, uh, clearly his technical expertise must be uh, part of the movie, right? No, <laughs> uh, of course, <laughs> no, no, doesn't doesn't come to play at all. Uh, and then we also meet uh, the the other human woman, um, uh, Elena, who is an in, uh, intern working uh, at a uh, antiquities museum on Ellis Island. And is there an antiquities museum on? I guess there could be. I suppose like there would be enough artifacts from all the immigrants coming through that you could do something with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I know there is a museum there. I don't. I just didn't realize it was in. It, it, I don't know if it's antiquities or not. But um, hmm. but uh, but yeah. So they they get an artifact, and it's a it's a bird. It's about this high, and they think it's Egyptian because it might represent Horus, but it has the maximal symbol on the front of it. Hmm. Uh, and uh, you come to find out that inside of it is uh, one half of the trans warp key, and of course it it shoots a shoots a beam of light into the sky. Tell me if you've seen that before. <laughs> yeah, this sounds suspiciously like two the two different Justice League movies I saw that were technically the same Justice League movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, so then uh, that catches the attention of the Autobots and the four. Autobots that we meet are, of course, Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, RC, and uh, Mirage. And through a, a series of circumstances, uh, Noah ends up in in Mirage, and uh, that's how he gets wrapped up in all, all the stuff of the Autobots. Because Optimus Prime wants the the transwarp key because uh, it's their way of getting back to Cybertron. Uh, and of course, uh, they end up not getting the that half uh, scourge ends up getting it and so then they have to go to south america to get to prevent scourge from getting the other half uh and that's when they run into the maximals with optimus primal and or well they they actually they meet air razor in um new york yeah, air, air then, is a good choice to include yeah um and then uh yeah i'll, I'll try to keep it like kind of spoiler light um with it, uh, in case anybody out there might want to watch it. I mean, it's, it, Air Razor is in the movie, so most likely uh, that's the character who would die, since it's one of the only characters in the original show who ended up dying, as memory serves. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that makes sense now. Actually, um, no, I think it's more they got merged into uh, Tigertron and... That's right, Tigertron and Air Razor, who... Air Razor was a... Was Air Razor a woman in this? Yes. Okay. See, so, yeah, I know that in the Japanese dub, it was actually a guy, and they were uh, doing like uh, they're doing a, a a gay thing with the two of them. Oh, jeez. Which I I think that the character does actually look more male when you pay attention. So uh -huh. it's, but that's that's either here or there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So they they go to South America, and then they they meet up with the rest of the Maximals. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the big, uh, so two kind of big sticking points I had, uh, or negatives that I have with this movie. One is how Optimus Prime views humans. He doesn't oh. like humans. He, he just, he, he doesn't, he doesn't trust them. He doesn't like being around them. Uh, and then of course the, the only, there's only one reference in there to Bumblebee. And that's when Bumblebee tells him, you know, Hey, a human was really nice to me. <clears throat> in that one movie from 28 2019 or so yeah <laughs> uh and then uh but and of course but then speaking of bumblebee uh, uh he gets knocked out for like almost all the movie and i i think that's oh. for two reasons yeah I, I think it's for two reasons one i mean he had his own movie so i mean it's you know that's true you don't want to get greedy Right. And and two, they wanted more screen time for Mirage, who is voiced by Pete Davidson. Y you would recognize him if you saw him. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking a moment here. He, uh, Davidson. uh. Oh, that guy? Yes. <laughs> so, how, how, on a scale of one to ten, where one is, uh, the original Iron Man and ten is, Ant-Man, Quantumania, or Multiverse of Madness. How cringe Marvel humor is he? Um, probably, I, I would say closer to Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania on that Oof. scale. Oh, that sounds painful. I mean, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's just like, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I know we were kind of young in, the, in 1994. I don't remember people fist bumping back then no um it's, where i remember fist bumping really coming like really becoming into its own was around when obama was elected because that's what he was doing yeah uh, it was, yeah well yeah I, I, yeah it's like mid uh, yeah probably mid to late 2000s 
And, yeah, was when that was when that came into thing. But it, it like so Mirage and, and Noah, he's Mirage like to Noah, hey, hey, fist bump. I'm like, they that, were doing that then. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that was like the era of high fives. Yeah. Um, right. now, now I don't, I wouldn't doubt that. I think I think high fives one of those things where it started off with uh, African American communities and then got popularized in media and just contact with people. Yeah. So, so it could be that fist bumping was a thing back then. I guess it's also one of those things where that's what the kids do these days. So it's like if you're trying if you're trying to relate to them, um what what was the name of that one uh show on uh, that one cowboy show on HBO? Uh Deadwood? Deadwood, yeah. Uh what I've heard is that uh it was based on real life uh based on real life cowboys and at the time they were seen as these like you know people who were just full on cursing all the time oh they're, they're so profane and if you actually listen to the talk they're like dag nabbit yeah <laughs> you know like like old timey minor talk right which at the right. time was seen as profane because oh you know it doesn't matter if they said dag instead of god and nabbit instead of damn it you know it's, it's clearly uh that's that's clearly profane anyway which of course if you did that they would sound ridiculous so that's why they why show is full of f-bombs and and other uh, stuff yeah. so, so it would have the proper impact so it's like if the kids would understand a fist bump it's like okay it's i guess it's allowable yeah yeah okay but um but yeah so um so the, does, the that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to be bothered by it though and you're right it probably right. isn't historical that he would know what a fist bump was <laughs> yeah yeah um, but I, I would say overall the movie is okay. It's it's not. I don't. I didn't think it was horrible. Um, I like the I, the action. I actually like the action scenes in this, and the and the CGI was pretty good. Um, I would say that I like the action scenes in this better than the Michael Bay movies because the Michael Bay movies were so chaotic and frenzied. Yeah. Like you couldn't. Oh, you mean you could actually see what was going on in this? That's a, yes. that's a huge step up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you you could actually see who was fighting who and what was what was going on. Yeah, what a concept. Yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, it, it was. I would say it's um, not as good as Bumblebee. Okay, better than the last two Transformers movies with Mark Wahlberg, which which isn't hard. Yeah, um, and then but I would I would say it's kind of on par. It's somewhere between. I would say better than Revenge of the Fallen, and the, or uh, yeah, better than Revenge of the Fallen, but maybe not quite as good as Dark of the Moon. Okay. Yeah. Um. So it may it's not a it's nothing special. It's just kind of a you know I mean it's it's a it it kept me entertained. Uh, it kept me kind of engrossed in the story. Um. But uh, it but yeah it's I mean it's you know I mean I I can see why this movie wasn't really uh popular yeah and when, when i was like being negative on it before it's probably because i was like split between what to do with my nights like I, I guess i might give this movie a shot so it's like when you're already kind of on the fence about watching it or not you're yeah. kind of looking for reasons to go do something else yeah yeah um but uh but yeah so uh one other thing um and this is a this is a spoiler for the end of the movie uh, I, although I, I don't feel too bad about spoiling it because I don't think this is going to happen. Um, okay. Uh, at the end of the movie, uh, Noah goes in for a job interview, and uh, but the job that he's interviewing for isn't the job that he thinks he is. And then he he finds out that it's it's actually working for a top secret government organization. Now, at first, I thought it was Sector Seven because that was the it's the top secret organization in the Transformers universe, but no, it's GI Joe. Yeah, with this movie making about four hundred and fifty million worldwide on a budget of one hundred ninety-five, that that seems likely that somebody over at Hasbro is going to go. Um, hold on, guys, this might not be the wisest idea. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and um, the his. Uh, so Noah's a whole communications um, speciality. It didn't. It took me until after the movie was over to figure out who they were setting him up to be. And if you know your GI Joe lore, which I don't, <laughs> uh, Breaker. Hmm. 
Okay. Breaker was okay. Breaker was the communications guy on GI Joe. Now, I guess one one amusing thing about nobody really going to see this particular, or not nobody, but you know, fewer people going to see this particular movie, is that it means that um, they could come out with the GI Joe movie, and the stink of this movie wouldn't necessarily reflect on it. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Now the, now, the stink of that Snake Eyes movie that they came out with a few years back that could do it, but yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, but but regardless, um, I'm glad you had a good time with it. Yeah, yeah. I had a kind of a similarly mixed reaction to the movie that I saw. So, so I had taken some time off of work, and I'd been kind of you know working out, doing some writing, um, a few other things, and I said to myself, you know, I feel like I haven't really gone anywhere. I, I should go see this movie that I saw reviewed over on on a film threat last month. And this is one where it's actually already available to buy digitally. So uh, it's, and I was, I actually was on the fence like, okay, do I, well, I would have to wait until the Friday of that week to actually see it when I was like, but I'm free Tuesday. Uh. So I went down, I drove an hour to the only theater that was still showing it an easy driving distance um, to see a joyride. What might have changed my mind is if I had known that Seth Rogen was producing Oh, uh, which I'll get into in a second. Mm -hmm. So the base premise of Joyride is it's very much like The Hangover, uh, in that it's like it's four friends in different stages of their life go on a wacky adventure that uh, that you know re redefines their lives. Mm -hmm. um, now I haven't ever actually bothered to go see The Hangover because I never thought it looked especially funny. And the the first one was pretty. The first one's pretty funny. Um, okay. The second one is basically the first one, except they're in Thailand instead of Vegas. And then the third, a lot of jokes about lady boys. Yeah, and then the third one was awful. Um, and hey, Chengis, good to see you. Hey, Chengis. Um, yeah, so I, I think I, but I, I, I'm sounding kind of negative, but I actually watching it was kind of fun. So. I don't know the actresses' names, and I don't remember their characters' names. So I'm just going to shake my mouse. Actually, we'll go left to right. So you kind of have some of the stock characters for this type of movie. On yeah. the left here, you have uh, this non-binary person who, uh, which actually only really came up at the end, and it's kind of like, okay, you're, you're clearly, uh, I, th I think she's, cl they, whatever, clearly kind of on the yeah. spectrum. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Big into K-pop, no direction in life, nothing really going on. Uh, in fact, at the at the end of the movie where they're meeting up and you see what they've been up to, I think the only thing that was really going on with them was that they, they were non-binary or something, and they might have been working at a, the restaurant more. Uh, but the, the quirky one, uh, one of the better scenes in the movie is she's uh, um, she's playing. Uh, card games with her cousin and uh she's just making up the rules to steal his money I, uh, I, like what game are, what, what game are you playing oh i i just put down cards in a random order until it's an american game oh you have a four she switches the chinese oh you have a four you lose automatically <laughs> um then you have the high-flying lawyer who uh there was like a stage in the 80s and 90s where uh you uh people would adopt the, the orphanages in uh, Korea and China and some of those countries in East Asia would adopt uh, children to the West. And so mm -hmm. she's basically she's basically culturally white. And it's actually kind of oddly racist against Chinese as they're in China, <laughs> which is a source of some humor. Yeah. <laughs> to the right here, you have her slacker loser best friend who is a uh, artist who she's like, oh, sure, my art looks like it's uh, just for shock value, but it's, you know, it's all about the, all about breaking down boundaries. <laughs> when, when it's just the art is like, mostly like, like uh, phalluses and fagoos and, uh, and like the concept for like a, uh, it, it almost feels like a character for out of bros, honestly. 
Oh. In terms of like, not that I've seen bros, but like the same sort of like level of raunchiness and like, wait, this is normal? Yeah. <laughs> then you've got this character who might, like, after our high flying lawyer, might be the most normal character in the cast, who's just an actress on a Chinese soap opera. Uh. <laughs> who um, happens to go to school with uh, the high flying lawyer. So like the the artist friend and the high flying lawyer have been friends ever since they were the only two Asian girls in their small town growing uh, up. Okay. So with that set up, um, basically the high flying lawyer is going to um, is going to China to close a big business deal, but she doesn't actually speak any Chinese, which is not what she told her company. Okay. <laughs> So uh, she brings along her loser artist friend. I, I basically, if, if if he was a male character, she'd be played by Zach Galifianakis back when, uh, he, was, back when he was fatter. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, and they also run into the so, but like they, the parents kind of, or somebody's parents kind of make them bring along the the crazy one, and they also run into the uh, actress there uh, to reconnect. And what we find out is that um, the, 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 the slacker friend is very insistent that the lawyer meets her birth mother. Okay. So, so she ends up derailing the whole trip to cause to do a road comedy trip about um, basically about them having wacky adventures through China. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, one of the reviews I saw a headline for said that it was like it, it was kind of funny, but there was like a heartfelt thing there. And it was like it really is kind of a movie about figuring out who you are, because where I said this related to me growing up, uh, I had a statistically unlikely number of Asian friends yeah. in my in my close friend group. Yeah. And they were that mix of adopted and and like immigrant. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So like I I could kind of see these characters in the various people I knew. Uh, okay. Now the thing is, it's it's very much a raunchy movie, and it's like nobody has any intentions of having a family and settling down. Nobody's looking for Mister Right. It's all about just going out and having fun. Um, so there there are a bunch of hook up scenes and. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess that's to be expected with a movie like this, right? Like, like. Although one of them is engaged, though I won't say who. Uh, there, there's also um, there. There were a few scenes that were kind of like it's. It's also very uh, sex positive in the sense that, well, of course you just hook up with people you just met like that. What? What are you a prude or something? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and and also uh, there might be, there might be a camera view that's from. The, that's from the perspective of inside of female uh, anatomy. Oh. Ugh. Um, and I actually kind of find myself thinking, you know, I think I, this might have been a better movie if they just focused on the friendship and heartfelt angle. Because, like, there's there's some funny bits, but and I enjoyed the funny bits. Like, there, there, were, there were some, like, some of the things, like, the lawyer being weirdly racist against Chinese people, even though she was Chinese. <laughs> That that was amusing. Um, the and they actually did like one really subtle thing that I liked. Where you, like while they're doing the introductory scene, setting things up, you have the two of them sitting watching TV, eating hot Cheetos. The Americanized one is just reaching her hands in and getting them dirty like an animal. But <laughs> the but the one who is you know like culturally Chinese was using chopsticks and keeping her fingers clean. So uh, that that was actually like as they were telling you about things that actually communicated a lot of information in one go. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, I, I I every time I find myself talking about this movie, I make it sound worse than I think it actually is. And there's a lot of people out there who would have like, well, why are you put off by the raunchiness? That's just life. It's like, okay, then this movie is a hundred percent for you. <laughs> uh, but um, I but I also it's like. I enjoyed this movie more than a lot of people, specifically because of that friend group I had growing up. Mm. So, like, I connected. The, I think I connected with this movie most more than most white people would. 
just be just because I had that experience. Yeah. I think there's also like I think there's also some universal stuff in here about finding yourself and I, I almost would want to see what this would look like if they just made a drama out of it rather than a Seth Rogen comedy. Yeah, or 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 even like a, a like a a dramedy, if you will, something like um, oh, I can't think of a filmmaker who makes movies like that. But yeah, some you know, a, a, a nice mix of of drama and comedy. Yeah, like um, I I think I for just my personal comfort level, I probably would have enjoyed the PG thirteen version of this better. Yeah, but other people, you know, if you're if you are big on things like. Well, from the producers of Bad Neighbors, This is the End, and Blockers, which doesn't have an Oxford comma, and that bothers me in that title. <laughs> uh, if, if you like those movies, then go for it. Like the, I like guess just a little bit outside of my comfort zone in some areas. Yeah. And uh, hey, Ninja, good to see you. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's like a very tepid recommendation. Like, it's just... yeah. Watch the trailer, and if you think you would enjoy a, a wacky slapstick sex comedy, then have at. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I I guess with our things of the week, it's um um good but Meh. not great. Meh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like your yours yours is more mainstream and easy to watch. Mine yeah. is like, wow, was this made specifically for me? Which, yeah. <laughs> At least as far as an American audience, we or I get you know, an, yeah, a general American audience would go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which you know that that kind of niche nicheness to it might explain why I think it's total box office. Like what? Um, I think it might already be out of theaters. Let me just yeah. you know, ride. I want to say it's like total box office internationally was like less than five mil or so. Oh, 14 mil. Okay, did better than I thought. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's 